Thank you, Rick. Thank you. I told the first service you should wait to do that till after I'm done, but we'll, we'll see. On July 2nd, 1982, while living in Los Angeles, uh, Larry Walters attempted to fulfill his lifelong dream of flying, only he didn't use anything remotely designed for flight. Larry used a lawn chair. The plan was to attach a few balloons filled with helium to the lawn chair and, and let it rise him about 30 feet above the ground where he would enjoy some time in the air. Then he was gonna shoot the balloons with a pellet gun and you know descend softly to the ground. What could go wrong, right? So Larry and his girlfriend, they buy 45 eight-foot weather balloons. They fill them with helium. They tie the chair to the ground. He then puts on a parachute straps himself to the chair with a belt. He has a pellet gun, a CB radio, some sandwiches for a snack, and a beer. As if anyone surprised there was beer involved, right? His girlfriend cuts the ropes that hold him and he ascends quickly past his 30 intended feet. In fact, he goes past 100, 1,000, 10,000, all the way to 15,000 feet in 15 minutes. He got so high, he was afraid to shoot out the balloons, and he had no control over the lawn chair, and so he starts gliding through what was then, you know, air control space for LAX, Los Angeles International Airport. Here's some pictures of Larry. You can see them on, on the screens there. He was actually spotted by two commercial pilots <laughs> that called into air traffic control. I wish I could hear those recordings. Like, uh, air traffic control, this is uh, United Flight 320. Uh, we see a man in a lawn chair at 15,000 feet holding a beer. <laughs> Please advise, right? <laughs> After 45 minutes of flight, he finally works up the courage to shoot out some balloons. He starts descending to the ground. After 90 minutes in the air, he reaches the ground, is promptly greeted by and arrested by police. And then a news reporter was there for the moment and asked what I think is a hilarious question. Why did you do this? It's like asking a three-year-old why they did something. And Larry said, I've had this dream for 20 years. It's just something I had to do. And then he said this, a man can't just sit around. Which is ironic. A man can't just sit around. Yet I wonder how often in my own faith, I wonder how often in Christianity, we choose to sit in our lawn chairs of comfort, waiting for God to do the impossible. We all want God to do the impossible, don't we? We all do. The problem is we are often afraid to do the unthinkable in order to see it happen. And that's what I want to unpack for us today with this big idea, if you want to write it down. God will often do the impossible when we are willing to live in the unthinkable. God will often do the impossible when we are willing to live in the unthinkable. Now, now please hear me. I am not talking about a spiritual formula that, that if I do X and Y, then God has to do Z. That, that's not what I'm talking about. That's not how the Christian faith works. But if you look at scripture, if you look at Christian history as a whole, God often does what we call impossible when ordinary people like you and me are willing to live in the unthinkable. Not just moments here and there where we take risks for the Lord, but living in a posture living with a posture that opens the door to an unthinkable, even impossible life. So here's the big question I wanna ask today. How can we live an unthinkable life? If you wanna make it personal, how can I live an unthinkable life? Now there's dozens of things I'm sure we could talk about. We're going to see three things in our main scripture, 1 Samuel 14, verses 1 through 23. 
1 Samuel's in the Old Testament portion of the Bible. We won't be reading all of these verses today just for sake of time. We will read quite a few of them. So if you want to follow along in your own Bible or on the Harbor app, we have all the verses and even the sermon notes there for you to follow along. Uh, you can also follow along on the screens. All the scripture will be there. Little background, here in this passage, the army of Israel, led by King Saul, has dwindled down to about 600 men. Much of the army has actually defected over to the enemy army, the Philistines. And if that wasn't bad enough, in the entire army of Israel, there's only two swords that existed. Two weapons in the whole army. One for Saul, one for his son, Jonathan. That brings us to our main scripture today. 1 Samuel 14, starting in verse 1, says this. One day, everyone help me out and say one day. day. And I have to stop there. Some of you are like, if he stops every two words, we're going to be here when baptism starts next week. But I promise I'm not going to do this all the way through. I just love the phrase one day in the Bible itself. And I know it's only two words, and yes, I understand it's a transitional phrase, I get that. But these are two very powerful words in my mind that are actually used in Scripture 120 different times to start a sentence. In the life of Jesus alone, in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see this phrase, one day, used over and over and over again. It says things like, one day Jesus was teaching, or one day Jesus was walking on the shore, or one day Jesus was on the way to the temple. And on those days, the blind re- received sight, the, the lame were made to walk, the, the deaf could, could hear, the dead were raised to life, sins were forgiven, lives were transformed, entire destinies of people were changed on one day. So all that (laughs) to say this, today could be your one day. Today could. Maybe God will place a calling in your heart or slay a giant in your life. Maybe today's the day he forgives you of your sins, fills you with the Holy Spirit, restores that broken relationship or begins to break that addiction in your life or brings healing to the most damaged parts of your soul. Whatever it is, today could be your one day because God can do more in one day than we could ever dream of accomplishing in a lifetime, in one day. So back to our main scripture. One day, Jonathan said, and I got to stop there, just kidding. (laughs) People are about to leave at this point. Jonathan said to his armor bearer, come on, let's go over to where the Philistines have their outpost. But Jonathan did not tell his father what he was doing. Meanwhile, Saul and his 600 men were camped on the outskirts of Gibeah around the pomegranate tree at Migron, in my mind, lounging in their lawn lawn chairs. No one realized that Jonathan had left the Israelite camp. To reach the Philistine outpost, Jonathan had to go down between two rocky cliffs that were called Bozes and Sina. The cliff on the north was in front of Michmash. The one on the south was in front of Geba. I've actually stood at these two cliffs in Israel in person. Here's a picture of, uh, that I took while we were at these cliffs. We can get that picture. Uh, the, on the far side there are the cliffs that would have been in front of Michmash. We were standing just out the, outside the modern day town of Geba. And you used to be able to go down into the ravine there in between the cliffs that this would have happened at. The only problem is this is now Palestinian controlled country in Israel. So we were on the other side of a barbed wire fence. Here's a picture there. I put my phone through the fence to take a picture of the, of the cliffs that were right there. Side, side note here, um, um, I already had a trip planned to Israel next March that I will be leading uh, along with a, a group called Faith-Based Expeditions. And the Harbor leadership has graciously allowed me to keep that trip on my schedule. And it's open to, to you if you want to go. Uh, there are some spots left available. It is a faith-changing opportunity if you're able to go. And uh, I would, there's some brochures out in the, at the information desk in the lobby. It will also be on the harbor.life website as soon as the service is over this afternoon. You can get your information and sign up there. So Saul and his men were sitting in the comfort of their lawn chairs around the pomegranate tree when Jonathan said to his armor bearer, we got to do something. 
A man can't just sit around. So let's go over to the outpost of the Philistines. God will often do the impossible when we're willing to live in the unthinkable. So how do we live an unthinkable life? The first thing I see here is this, be willing to leave comfort behind. Be willing to leave comfort behind. Aren't we often more like Saul in our faith than we care to admit? Sitting in our lawn chair of comfort, sipping fresh pomegranate iced tea. <laughs> Maybe it's just me. Like even as your new pastor, I struggle with moments of choosing comfort over what I know God wants me to do. You know what the crazy part is? In my life, it's usually not the big things that God's asking me to do where I choose comfort. It's super easy things. Things like talking to a neighbor. I'm an introvert. I know it doesn't seem like it when I'm up here all gregarious, but I'm, I'm an introvert, so small talk is not comfortable for me. Put me in a room with 500 people doing this, I am right at home. Put me in a room with five people, and after the weather and sports, I got nothing. Like, big gulps, huh? Well, see you later. How about them cowboys choked again? Wyoming cowboys, not the Dallas cow. I would never... I would never say anything about the Dallas Cowboys. It's just uncomfortable for me to do simple things like just talking to a neighbor. But one of the things I know God wants me to do is connect with my neighbors, to love them, to serve them if I can. I even pray regularly that God would give me the opportunity to meet them, to talk with them, to share my faith if that, you know, comes up in the conversation. But I can't tell you how many times I have come home from whatever it is, a long day at work or doing something with the family. You pull in the driveway, you see a neighbor outside in their yard, and the Holy Spirit just nudges me. Go say hi. Go, go introduce yourself. Like, this is what you've been praying for. And I'm putting it right in front of you. And I wish I could say I've always followed that nudge from the Spirit. But I haven't. There's been plenty of times, even as a pastor, I disobey the voice of God, go into the house, ignore the nudge, and choose to sit in my lawn chair of comfort, if you will, sometimes an actual lawn chair on my back patio. And there's been several times where I've chosen comfort over the call of God to talk to a neighbor. I go inside, and then I just get that that loving conviction from the Holy Spirit of what are you doing? This is what you prayed for. And I've had those moments where I have to confess to the Lord, I've, forgive me, I repent of that. And I go back outside, the neighbor's gone. And I gotta live with the reality that I missed my moment. I missed my opportunity. And, and that may not be where, where you struggle with being uncomfortable. Let's just be honest. Some of you are way too comfortable talking to your neighbors. Like you are the people introverts run from when they see you in the neighborhood. <laughs> just being honest. All I'm saying is we all have those places and we all have those times where it's just easier to sit around. But as Larry said, a man can't just sit around at least not if you want to live an unthinkable life. So I would just challenge all of us to ask this question. What part of my life am I most tempted to stay comfortable? What is it? And then Jesus helped me to leave comfort behind so that you can do whatever you want to do in and through my life. And leaving comfort behind isn't always doing more. Sometimes leaving comfort is slowing down enough to actually sit in the presence of God and allow him to reach down deep into those darkest places you don't want him going to. But you got to leave some comfort in order to get there. God will often do the impossible when we are willing to live in the unthinkable. So 
how can we live an unthinkable life? Got to leave, be willing to leave comfort behind. Number two is this, bank on the character of God. Bank on the character of God. Continuing in our scripture, verse six. Let's go across to the outpost of those pagans, Jonathan said to his armor bearer. Perhaps the Lord will help us, for nothing can hinder the Lord. He can win a battle whether he has many warriors or only a few. Perhaps the Lord will help us. Wow. Think about the absurdity of what that sounds like in our human thinking. Jonathan risked his life on a maybe. Maybe God will show up. Maybe God will help us. Maybe God will do the impossible. But isn't this the story of so many followers of Jesus throughout the centuries? Like this was the story of Rick and Marie and a handful of families who started the harbor 24 years ago. The reality is the harbor exists today because a group of people were willing to leave comfort behind and bank on the character of God, and I, for one, am so thankful they did. Can I get an amen today? I'm so thankful for the risk that you and others took to make this a reality. So thank you again, Rick and Marie, for what you've done. How easy would it have been for the founders of the harbor to just wait around the pomegranate tree, to sit in their lawn chair of comfort? I mean, they had this burden, they had this, this passion, this vision to start a church where Jesus would restore those who are battered and broken, refuel those who are weary and worn, and that we would each return to our lives with Jesus at the center, changing the world one life at a time. But how easy would it have been to just wait? Well, if that's what God wants to do, we'll wait for him to move. If we had a building, we could do it. If we had this many people or this much money or, or whatever it is, then, then we'd actually, and yes, there are times that we need to be wise in how we move forward in life. I am not talking about taking risk for risk's sake like Larry did in his lawn chair. That is not what I'm talking about. But at some point, Rick and Marie and, and, the, and the other couples, they had to step out in faith at some point. The, the, those who founded the harbor had to step out and say, perhaps the Lord will help us, for nothing can hinder the Lord. He can win a battle whether there's many warriors or only a few. And 24 years later, this exists. Why? Because God did show up and did the impossible when some of his followers were willing to live in the unthinkable. And listen, Sometimes the impossible thing God does is not found in providing the miracle. Sometimes the impossible thing God does is gives us the power to endure and overcome when he doesn't do the miracle. Some of the greatest miracles that God's ever done are not the healing and provision but the power to walk through life's greatest problems yet still be filled with abundant life in Christ. The abundant life that, that Jesus offers, the full life from Jesus, is not me getting all my heart desires. It's me getting all of Jesus so that when I don't get what my heart desires, I am still full of joy in the Lord. So he does that too. Not just the miracles and provisions, but the power to endure when he doesn't do that. So again, I challenge each of us to ask, not just where we should leave comfort behind, but Lord, where in my life do I need to bank on your character? Where do I need to live in the perhaps? And may you help me, Lord, trust you, knowing that you can win a battle, whether there's many warriors or a few. I would even add whether there's any warriors 
you can win the battle. God will often do the impossible when we're willing to live in the unthinkable. So how do we live an unthinkable life? Well, be willing to leave comfort behind. Bank on the character of God. Perhaps the Lord will help us. And then number three, the last thing here. Build a community you can trust. Build a community you can trust. Jonathan tells the armor bearer, let's climb this cliff and attack the enemy. And remember, they had one sword. Jonathan had it, not the armor bearer. And his reason why they should do this was maybe. Maybe God will help us is the reason we should go. I don't know about you. You're probably a way better follower of Jesus than I am. But if I were the armor bearer, I'm not sure how I'd respond. I'd have a few questions. I, ha I have a few things in my mind of how I might respond. Things like, homie, say what? <laughs> what you talking about, Willis? <laughs> uh, bye, Felicia. Like something. Few in my mind. Verse 7. Do what you think is best, the armor bearer replied. I'm with you completely, whatever you decide. Woo. Now, I don't know what kind of relationship Jonathan and the armor bearer had. I, I, I do know in this culture, many times, the armor bearer was the most trusted companion of these warriors. They were always with them. They were confidants, encouragers, equippers. So I, I don't know what kind of community or relationship they had. All I know is this. We need, I need a community around me who will say, I'm with you completely, whatever you decide. Not, not someone who supports your sin, but someone who will support you and stand with you in your sin. Those sins, the ones from your life you don't want anyone to know about. That person who can not only speak hard truth into your life, but will also stand with you no matter what. I'm with you completely, whatever you decide. Do you have that person? For me, that person is my best friend, Todd. Todd's actually here in this service along with a great number of people, friends from our church that we pastored up in Wyoming. There's actually three guys from my small group that are here today to support me on this very special day. In that group that I had, that community we built, I wasn't their pastor, I was their friend. I shared things with them in that group as a father, as a husband, as just a son of God. We, we together shared our hurts, our hopes, our habits, and our hangups. When the time came, I, I shared with my group this thing that was happening in my life and what it would mean leaving that community. And you know the very first thing Todd said to me? You know what it was? I'm with you completely, whatever you decide. I'm climbing with you. And that's what happened in this story. Jumping to verses 13 through 15. So they climbed up using both hands and feet and the Philistines fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer killed those who came behind them. They killed some 20 men in all and their bodies were scattered over about half an acre. Suddenly panic broke out in the Philistine army, both in the camp and in the field including even the outposts and raiding parties. And just then, an earthquake struck and everyone was terrified. God did the impossible when they were willing to live in the unthinkable. If you continue reading, it says that Saul and his men heard the commotion and they left their comfort and joined the battle. It even says that soldiers who had defected 
to the Philistine army turned against the Philistines and joined Jonathan and the armor bearer on the mission. And God won a battle that day. When his children were living, willing to live in the unthinkable. Friends, their faith was contagious and ours will be too if we're willing to leave comfort behind, bank on the character of God and build a community we can trust. But here's where I was so challenged in preparing for this message. I was doing the work of preparing and getting this ready to go and I, I again, that loving conviction from the Spirit just asked, why do you always read stories like this and make yourself the hero? Why do I read this story and think I'm Jonathan? We never read the story as if we're Saul. That'd be a lousy sermon. We don't read it as if we're the Philistines. We definitely don't read it as if we're the ones who defected to the enemy. We read the story as if we're Jonathan and we are gonna accomplish all these great things for God. And listen, we can and we should, as we have done today, learn from stories like this in the Bible, Jonathan and other Bible heroes. But really, I'm not Jonathan in the story and neither are you. When you get right down to it, Jesus is Jonathan. You and I are the armor bearers and we are called to have the same attitude he had. I'm with you completely, Jesus, whatever you decide. You see, Jesus already climbed a hill once called Calvary. On that hill, he'd be crucified for the sins of mankind. He would take on the enemy and win, conquering death and hell and the grave forever. He would rise from the dead. Jesus is the warrior of the story. I'm Jonathan, I'm the armor bearer. You're the armor bearer. And because of what he's already done for me, paying the price for my sins and rising from the dead, if that's all Jesus ever did for me, it's enough. And so the only appropriate response to what Jesus has done is I'm with you completely. Whatever you decide, I'm with you. Jesus, if, since you left comfort behind for me, I'm gonna do it. Since you banked on the character of God for me, I'm gonna do it. And since you modeled for me what it looks like to live in community, I'm gonna do it too. You realize Jesus had a small group? Peter, James, and John, his inner circle, the 12 disciples and others, and you read the gospel story, it took three years, but at the end of those three years, he bore his soul to that group, even knowing that one would betray him. So maybe today's the day you leave some comfort behind and try a small group. Because if Jesus needed one, maybe I do. I'm gonna ask the band to come out. We're gonna close with a song called Sea of Victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to the Lord. It's not my battle, it's his. I don't know what battles are being faced in the room today. I don't know what your battle is. All I know is this, perhaps the Lord will help us for nothing can hinder the Lord. He'll win a battle whether there's many warriors or only a few. So I'm, during this song, if you wanna just thank God for what he's done and just declare it, do it. If you wanna confess some things, do it. If you need to repent, do it. I'm gonna be down here worshiping my brains out. That's what I do. But I'm gonna see a victory, friends. Why? Because it's not my battle. It's his. And I wanna do what the armor bearer did. I'm with you completely, whatever you decide. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for 
everything you've done, that you can win a battle, whether there's many warriors or only a few. And Lord, we're gonna enter into spiritual battle with our worship right now. And Lord, I pray right now in this room, whatever's needed for every heart, that your Holy Spirit would reach down and touch our hearts in special and unique ways. And Lord, we are with you completely, whatever you decide. In Jesus' name, amen.